Okay, hi everybody. Uh, hope you're all having a great morning. Uh, as Ilad alluded to, um, what I wanted to discuss today is a little bit of an extension of kind of a philosophical exploration on Monday's uh, Chiplet workshop, um, where um, I wanted to talk about a trend that unfortunately we're probably a part of as, as much as a lot of other companies in the industry where um, folks are very focused on uh, leveraging advanced packaging technology to do chiplet-based integration. And one of the things that, um, that, that we've seen as a part of that is that you can do great things and you can achieve great metrics, um, but it's kind of an orthogonal uh, approach to having an open chiplet economy. Um, so I wanted to talk about some of those challenge, challenges today and um, give people some things to think about and maybe in my own little way steer uh, how we as an industry are working towards building next generation um, interoperable chiplets. So this is kind of my view of the perfect world. Uh, we made a little um, you know, advanced uh, processor design here. Uh, with an FPGA, IO chiplets, and hey, let's put in a machine learning accelerator on that thing as well, right? So we kind of have this chiplet-based functionality, a lot of different kinds of blocks with a, uh, a lot of different capability, and I can build this. I can build this today, use, use that great advanced package technology, um, and have wonderful interfaces that line up perfectly. Um, and, you know, ideally, hopefully, uh, every interface has a common link layer so they can communicate with each other. Um, another thing that I find really fascinating is can every interface have every link layer uh, for die-to-die -die interconnect? Can we do things like that to make this work and enable an open chiplet economy? Now the problem with this kind of design, even if we solve link layer communication issues, is reuse. Right, so let's say I go from that great scalable design that has all that function and I want to make an uh, even bigger processor, a big scalable processor system. The minute I do that is if my die weren't all exact dimensions in my system, uh, the I.O. chip gets kind of disconnected. It's not going to work, right? So, well, if I want to make a new processor, I got to make a new I.O. chiplet, um, which is a, is a bit of a problem, right? We invested a lot of money in making that. Um, building a whole new one uh, just to get some, I'd say, you know, variation in the function of the chiplet-based system is a problem. Now there's a solution to this, and I think um, this was kind of alluded to in the earlier presentation, um, where you could just tell every chiplet it has to be the same size, right? So unfortunately in my original system, if I make every chiplet the same size, and let's say we pick the biggest one as the, like, the least common denominator, um, I end up wasting a ridiculous amount of space for some of the function, right? We need to be able to connect things together that have varying um, capability, varying function, or in different technologies, and there just isn't, isn't a clear way to make that happen. So what I'd like to recommend we start thinking more and more about as an industry is building chiplet-based systems that have a little bit of freedom. Um, you know, we, as Elad alluded to, um, most advanced package interconnect and, and IO that's developed to support advanced package interconnect, you go a couple millimeters, maybe. Um, but I, I'd really like to see, in order to enable an open chiplet economy, a way to allow chiplets to really plug and play by just loosening things up a little bit, making interfaces that can go a little bit more distance so that we've got capability to, as long as we fix link layer issues and we can communicate with each other, be able to build these plug and play systems. Now the downside is, this isn't perfect, right? We waste package space. Uh, we could, we're probably gonna waste power, right? A lot of, uh, a lot of interfaces that, um, that go over uh, standard package interconnect or, or even longer traces of RDL are gonna consume a bit more power um, than um, interfaces which are micro-optimized to very short reach interconnect. But uh, I'd like to suggest that the benefit of this is the freedom to play, um, to make any kind of design you want to uh, out of these chiplets and be able to flexibly connect these interfaces together um, so that you could build lots of different kinds of systems out of, let's say, a handful of base chiplet designs. 
And uh, with that, I'm going to uh, hand the microphone over to Ramin, uh, who's going to help us get through the next problem, uh, memory optimization. Thanks, Ramin. Thank you so much, Mark. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So in the next part of the talk, I, I'd like to talk about uh, a new type of uh, die-to-die -die interface for memory chiplets and uh, also discuss how such an interface can help uh, increase the adoption of uh, chiplets in general and specifically memory. Let's see if I can do this. So why memory? Of course, we, we talk a lot about uh, Moore's law coming to an end, and that's, that's a fact. But in the past 20 years, in fact, because of Moore's law actually helped us to get faster and faster processors. Almost as you see in this graph, like the performance of processors grew by 90,000x, and that's a significant amount. At the same time, the performance or the bandwidth to the external, to the memory, to the other uh, peripheral chips, has only grown by 30x, maybe 50, and maybe at max uh, 100. So there is like a 1,000x gap between what the processor can process versus the bandwidth to the memory, especially, and that is causing a major performance limitation, something that people today call the memory wall. So that's addressing the memory issue and the bandwidth of the memory is an important thing. And that's part of a goal of uh, what we call the UMI or universal memory interface. That's basically define a die-to-die -die interface that is optimized for memory traffic, so is efficient for that purpose, and as a result is optimized in terms of area, beach run, and so forth, and uh, introduce a middle memory chiplet between the ASIC and the memory itself that is tailored to that specific type of memory, whether it's DDR, LPDDR, or HBM. The ASIC stays the same, has a UMI interface on its sides, and all we have to do is to change this memory chiplet. And that also simplifies not only the design of that uh, ASIC, increases the bandwidth to that ASIC, and uh, also make it flexible to, to connect to any memory types later on. So this is kind of like a high-level view of that, uh, this concept, where the memory chiplet sits between the DRAM and your ASIC, the memory controller, which is specific to this type of DRAM, whether it's DDR or GDDR, sits on the chiplet with the specific memory phi. On the other side is a unified interface, both in terms of phi and adapter. So if this DRAM changes, you don't need to redo this big ASIC, you just change this memory chiplet here. And of course, maybe I jumped too fast. What is important here is this traffic for the memory is bidirectional, but half duplex. You either read or write. And that's something that <clears throat> we like to take advantage as part of defining this uh, memory interface to basically all the existing die-to-die -die interfaces being UCIE or Bo, they are defined as unidirectional. The lane is either defined to be TX or RX in the beginning. But when you're dealing with memory traffic, you either read, read or write. So Similar to any other file that we have in the memories, DDR5, for example, the same port is used to basically transmit data to the memory when you write it, and the same port used to read data from that same port of the memory. So by sharing, because one of the key things in die-to-die -die connectivity is the number of wires, the number of bumps that you want to use. So by sharing that trace and the bump for read and write, effectively you're doubling the efficiency of your beachfront for that type of traffic. So this is one of the main proposals of this idea, and basically following the same way that memory files historically have been following, basically using bidirectional, but by bidirectional I mean half duplex bidirectional or dynamic bidirectional, whichever you want to call it, not that it's simultaneous bidirectional. So there is no new design needed really in this part. We just transmit, stop transmitting, and then uh, receive it. Some of the high-level target specs that we are thinking of, of course, is if you want to especially address HBM memory, so we like an HBM memory form of chiplet, we like these interface to provide the beachfront bandwidth of the HBM, especially if you want to target HBM4 and the next generation to be forward-looking. So once we target that kind of beachfront bandwidth, all the other memories also support it. 
we want the bandwidth to be the, the power to be low so that ASIC is not uh, hurt because of uh, you know basically optimizing the bandwidth and power for the ASIC, which is the key part. Reduce the latency when you have the disk buster around, so otherwise it will impact the read and write bandwidth that you have. And also propose it to have basically both for standard package and advanced packaging, but definitely standard packaging for the number of reasons that both Elad and Mark uh, talked about. Mainly, uh, for example, when you have a standard package, you have large sizes. You're not bounded by the size of the silicon interposer, and you can build bigger systems. The cost is better for mission critical applications like automotive. The uh, you know, it's much more reliable to standard packaging has been qualified for that application. And as Mark also mentioned, as an important factor is this the longer reach of the cable of, of the traces is key to be able to easily mix and match these chiplets uh, together rather than having to design them specifically for each package for each target silicon that we want to connect them to. So here are the, some of the sample benefits of um, using UMI system, UMI concept and chiplets. First of all is, let's say you have an ASIC in five, you wanna to go to the next generation in three nanometer. One of the long poles usually is to port all these files, which are analog mixed signal pieces. But by using UMI, when especially UMI itself, the file is rather simple. It doesn't take as much time to do compared to a DDR file. You can use a file in five nanometer or seven nanometer that is already verified and so forth, and design your ASIC and then quickly add and connect these chiplets to be, for, ex for example, connect to a DDR type of memory. Of course, the other advantage is that uh, the area that it takes these files on, on the chip is really large. A DDR file usually, I think, is about more than 10 millimeters squared just for around 50 gigabyte of data per second. But on UMI, it's, it's a die-to-die -die solution. It's by far smaller, so you get a lot of area saving on your ASIC. And at the same time, you get much more bandwidth efficiency going to your chip. So it in, improves the bandwidth to the memory from the ASIC within that same beachfront and uh, area that you use for it. So that's another key advantage that it provides for, especially when we're talking about the memory wall. And, um, also, it adds the flexibility. As I said, for example, Intel Sapphire Rapid has two versions. One's connected to DDR, one connected to HPM. But uh, with this notion, you can effectively use the same chip and connect it for different applications. So maybe example on the HPM side, basically on the left side, you see if you use a silicon interposer, there are a number of, it gives you the bandwidth, which is great, but there are a number of limitations that comes with it. Silicon interposer size is limited, so you can have limited number of HPM, limited ASIC in there. The micro bumps as test coverage issues, uh, the short reach as are the, disc, the issues that we discussed earlier as Mark shared. The high cost complexity, long manufacturing cycle, usually additional three months that you have to get to package these parts together, and also the limited supply chain. You know, Kovas has its own wait time to get in there, and unless you're special, you may not get there. But uh, once you introduce this memory chiplet for HPM, as an example, and define it efficient enough that you can run over standard packaging, all these negatives go away. You can have large areas, you can go a lot of HPMs on that chip to address not just the bandwidth, also the capacity required, the wafer coverage would be better. You're using standard bumps, and, you know, you can use wafer probes to test them. The longer reach is the key value, so on and so on, especially for automotive, that's another advantage that these are very verified, qualified type of uh, solution. And lastly, it's widely available. A standard package, you can just get it from many manufacturers and uh, does not have those issues. So it effectively opens up the market for people to use chiplets, especially memory chiplets. And if you want to put it all together, especially if you use UMI on a standard packaging that provides high bandwidth both for memory uh, chiplets and uh, HPM, DDR, and so on and so forth, you can create a complex uh, system like this. You have enough area, maybe you know, 100 by 100, 130 by 100, those are the typical package sizes that people have to build a real sophisticated system inside your chip. 
connect to any type of memory that, uh, that you need and get maximum bandwidth uh, into your chip. And this is especially critical for generative AI applications that they not only need high bandwidth of memory, but also large capacity. That HBM gives you the high bandwidth, the DDR connections or LPDDR or whatever you use can give you the higher capacity. And still you have enough areas or beachfront on the other side to connect to the other processors. So in conclusion, as I said, the memory files historically have always used uh, the, this bi-directional half duplex type of uh, interface. And uh, the DDR, the D2D files that have been defined so far have uh, mainly focused on general D2D traffic where the traffic is symmet symmetrical. Our proposal is to define one interface for memory, which is optimized for memory, that has this bi-directional capability so we can reduce the number of ports, especially for data that uh, you do read and write, and also have a unified protocol that uh, you can easily buy chiplets off the market from the chiplet ecosystem. Once the PHY and the protocol are defined and agreed on unified, you can easily connect them together. And uh, basically, this universal chiplet interface it helps you eliminate the memory wall, maximize the performance of the ASIC, simplify your ASIC design, leaves a lot of room, more room on your ASIC for um, other compute purposes, and also adopt, uh, accelerate the adoption of chiplets, especially memory chiplets uh, that you can buy you know, off the market. So the call to action that we have is that this is like Bo, is a new D2D interface. There was a great effort at OCP to turn that interface into a standard, and uh, we are looking for industry feedback on UMI now. What are, what are the necessary features? What are the protocol requirements? What are the preferred uh, packaging to start with? So on and so forth. And I've provided uh, the contact of Kevin Donnelly here, who's uh, in charge of uh, this run at uh, Elian, for any inputs and comments. Thank you. Any, any test chip or uh, test vehicle already planned? Oh. Correct, yes. Um, we are actually taping out it. We had a chip basically uh, in silicon, which basically was mainly on the physical side of these things, but we are taping out a chip that supports this UMI uh, pretty much next month with the target protocol and the interface, yeah. And that is using the HBM 2.2e uh, or 3 or 3.e, which versions of it? So UMI is not HBM interface. So this is an interface, in fact, very similar to Bo and UCI in terms of signaling, but it's uh, mainly on standard packaging. Just yeah, sure. So it's uh, the version that we are taping out is on standard packaging and we are targeting HBM4 bandwidth over that uh, beachfront of an uh, HBM4, which is about 10 millimeter. So that's what we are uh, we're going to demonstrate as a test chip. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you clarify the one big control per, per power number? Is that on the X side or the RX side, both? Um, how would I compare that to? Okay, that's a longer question. That's I don't know. <laughs> It's both sides, basically TX and RX, usually that's how we define uh, the picojoule per bit for the transmitters, like same as Bo. Okay, so it's the full link from TX to RX? Yes, that's for the full link, yes. What kind of speeds can you hit with UMI? Our target actually is not 32 gig per lane, is, uh, is a target that you can have to achieve this. Maybe for next generation HPM5, you, got to, you need to go faster, but at 32 gig per lane, Size is like 80% smaller than the 5 or the HBM? We, we, we lose it offline. Okay. That's great. Yeah. <laughs>